A warm welcome to you from Aberfeldy in Perthshire. This evening's service of worship comes to you from the heart of Scotland. The psalmist has some opening words for us. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Our opening hymn, led for us by the Aberfeldy Praise Band, is Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. prayers. We have heard about you, God of all power. You made the world out of kindness and love, creating order out of confusion. You made each one of us in your own image. Your fingerprint is on each one of our lives. So we praise you and worship you. We have heard about you, Jesus Christ, the carpenter who left his tools and trade, the poor man who made others rich, the healer who himself be wounded, the righteous one whom soldiers ill-treated, not knowing they were abusing the Son of God. So we praise and worship you. We've heard about you, Holy Spirit. You broke the bonds of race and nation to let God speak in every language. You made the disciples courageous and bold. You lead people to believe in Jesus Christ. You bring God's free gifts into human lives. You show how love makes all things new. 
You open the doors to freedom and change. So we praise and worship you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Lord of all, you are the source of all love, goodness, grace and mercy. We thank you for every opportunity to worship you and that we can do so in the company of your people. Praise you that every day of our lives you always have yet more of your love and goodness to reveal to us. Your generosity knows no bounds. In response, we come to offer ourselves to you. We come in this time of worship to know you, the living God, that our faith may be deepened and that your name may be glorified. We praise you, we love you, we worship you. Amen. Stories have a nice habit of staying in our minds and hearts and reminding us of themselves from time to time, no matter how long ago we first read them. In A. A. Milne's 1928 book, The House at Pooh Corner, we learn about a new game that Pooh Bear invented and everyone was delighted to join in with. The game was called Pooh Sticks and, like all good inventions, was discovered quite by chance. When Pooh was walking towards the bridge with a pine cone in his hand, he tripped up and thereby threw the pine cone into a river. He watched it come out the other side of the bridge. He tried big cones and small cones and cones together to see which was the fastest. When Pooh, Piglet, Rabbit and Roo joined together, they played with sticks, which they substituted for pine cones because it was easier to distinguish between them. So came about the game of Pooh Sticks to see whose stick could travel fastest under a bridge on a river. In Kenneth Graham's book, The Wind in the Willows, published in 1908, there's a meeting between Mole and Rat on a riverbank, where Rat has his home. It all began when Mole one day bounded joyfully across a meadow, through a hedge, over some fields, and suddenly came out on the bank of a river. Now Mole had never seen a river before. The water was full of life and movement, with glints and gleams and sparkles and chatter and bubbles. He was fascinated by the life in the water, and exhausted, exhausted by all his exertions, he sat down on a riverbank. And then Mole spotted a little brown face on the opposite bank. It was Water Rat. They got into a conversation. So, this is a river, says Mole. The river, reprised Rat, correcting him. And you really live by the river? asked Mole. What a jolly life! By it, and with it, and on it, and in it, explains Rat. It's my world, and I don't want any other. Rat's life was completely and utterly intertwined with and inseparable from the river. And when we reflect on and think about our Christian lives as disciples of Jesus, our situation is somewhat the same as water rat. Our lives are to be completely intertwined and inseparable from the Holy Spirit, Jesus' living water, his river of life, present within us. And now we come to our two Bible readings from John chapter 7 and John chapter 16. Jesus teaches at the feast. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. 
The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Amen. Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Amen. There are lots of famous rivers, such as the Amazon, the Danube, Limpopo, Nile, Seine, Yangtze, Thames, and the River Tay. Rivers are evocative and emotional things, like the sea into which they run. Rivers are a vital part of life as a mode of transport, a ready supply of water, providing outdoor pursuits and pastimes, being the arteries around which cities and towns and villages have been placed, or simply providing a beautiful view. Rivers and life have been closely intertwined across the centuries. Water in motion, water in perpetual flow, provides an evocative and emotional link to our understanding of God's Holy Spirit, God's continual outpouring of his power into the world, into the people he's created, 
and called to be his own. Jesus uses this evocative and emotional link when he talks in John chapter 7 of living water. Rivers and streams in flow have energy. They have kinetic energy. They have power. And the Holy Spirit imparts kinetic energy into our lives. The Spirit comes to energize our lives in the nature and ways of God. Water is mentioned in the Bible more often than any other material resource. There are many references to actual rivers and occasions when river is used in a symbolic sense. But rivers can bring both blessing, blessings and calamities. Rivers can symbolise prosperity, as Isaiah refers to in chapter 66, and judgment, Habakkuk chapter 3. And the withholding of God's provision is likened by Isaiah in chapter 19 to the drying up of a river. And the most striking image, I think, of flowing water in the Bible describes the eternal pouring forth of the Holy Spirit as the mighty river of life. And it's typified by the first river in Eden, the water flowing out from Jerusalem that Zechariah talks of, and water flowing from under the threshold of the temple that Ezekiel mentions in chapter 47. A spring, a stream of living water, vigorous, abundant life, was promised by Christ in John's Gospel. And that promise is made real through his glorification, in which he poured out his life under death. And at Calvary, blood and water poured from his side. Jesus literally opened the lock gates to the flow of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And all these significant and life-changing events find their ultimate expression in the crystal clear river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb in Revelation 21. The source of this spring of the water of life is the Lamb who with God reigns forever and ever. And very interestingly, the last invitation in the Bible in Revelation 22 is whoever wishes, let him take this free gift of the water of life. In John's Gospel, at the beginning of chapter 7, we learn that Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a great feast in the Jewish year, which celebrates the completion of harvest and God's goodness to the people during their desert wanderings on the way to the Promised Land. The name Tabernacles comes from the leafy shelters that they used to live in, although these days they're rather more substantial, as was my Jewish neighbour's tabernacle when we lived in London that I was invited to go in and look at in his garden year by year. In the early verses of John chapter 7, Jesus' brothers made what I think is a slightly sarcastic suggestion that if Jesus wanted to make a name for himself, he should get along to the Feast of Tabernacles. It will be an ideal time to do it. Well, Jesus at first appears to decline that suggestion, but of course he does go, but he goes in God's time, not the timing decided by his brothers. And at the feast, worshippers would have been reminded of the time when Moses struck the rock at Rephidim to bring water to the people in Exodus 17. Prophetic texts that one day living water will flow out of Jerusalem and a river would flow from under the rock, under the threshold of the temple. So on each of the seven festival days, people went in procession from the temple down to the fountain that fed the pool of Siloam. And there the priest would fill a golden vase from the running water and the choir would sing verses from Isaiah chapter 12, a song of praise. And the filled vase was then carried back to the temple through the water gate. 
and the people would process around the altar while the water was poured out over the altar. And this libation was understood to symbolize the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So into this picturesque, colorful, dramatic and worshipful occasion, Jesus delivers his claim to be the true water of life. The last day of the feast, the eighth day, was the day of waiting. The crowd gathered in the temple courts in silence. They prayed for the great day to come when the hope of all Israel will be fulfilled. And some may have expected a promised miracle of running water bursting out of the temple courts would actually come true. And this was the moment Jesus chose to stand and announce in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Jesus' public call at the Feast of Tabernacles was sensational and impressive. It was carefully prepared. This was no spur of the moment thing and the meaning of his claim couldn't be misunderstood. Some people responded to his words. Surely this man is the prophet, they said. Others said he is the Christ. And others said, how can Christ come from Galilee? Jesus' dramatic intervention on that day caused yet more controversy and division. And this is still true in today's world. In his book, Keep in Step with the Spirit, J.I. Packer introduces what he calls the floodlight ministry of the Holy Spirit in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. He tells a story of a time when, on an evening, he was walking to a church to preach on the theme, Father, glorify me in your presence. Words of Jesus from John 17. As he turned a corner, he saw the church was floodlit. It was exactly the illustration he needed. Good floodlighting focuses entirely on what is illuminated, not the lights themselves. All the details that need to be seen are strikingly revealed by the floodlights. The Holy Spirit is, so to speak, the floodlight shining on the Saviour. Packer also suggested that we can think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in another way. It's as though the Spirit is standing behind us, throwing a light over our shoulder on Jesus who stands facing us. The Spirit's message is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. The Spirit's message is always, look at him, see his glory, listen to him, hear his word, get to know him, have life, taste his gifts of joy and peace. Packer sees the Holy Spirit as a celestial matchmaker whose role is to bring us and Jesus Christ together and ensure we stay together. The Holy Spirit is alive, abroad and active in today's world in a multiplicity of ways. We can hear Jesus' words of invitation in John 7, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, as a call to reassess our own lives. Do we have hopes unfulfilled? We have our own crises of disappointment and disillusionment when life leaves us feeling empty and uncertain. We can know a thirst within us. The veil of earthly pleasures of wealth or success can be pulled aside and we realise that satisfaction never comes in those ways. The inevitable ups and downs of life, chances, 
changes, bereavements and illness can rob us of what is worthy and valuable and good. Even in our devotional life, however fervent and faithful and enthusiastic, we can long for something more real. And it's at these times that we hear the still small voice telling us that in place of all the broken systems that cannot hold water, Jeremiah chapter 2, is the Lord, the spring of living water. But it's not just in the challenging moments of our lives that we find renewed focus and strength from the Holy Spirit. He makes his presence real in our hearts and minds in all sorts of situations. It can happen when we're on the up, when we think, yeah, things are going well. All's good about the world and life, although perhaps rather more difficult to say that in these days. I know people called out of what they were happily doing because God had a different plan. And we know from his word that when the Lord calls, he will equip Hebrews 13. So watch out if that's you. Tomorrow could be a very different day. John 15, chapter uh, verse 5 says, If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Only by living in Jesus can we have fruitful lives and the fruit of the Spirit be produced in our lives. Going back to our opening story about mole and rat in the wind and the willows, living by Jesus isn't enough. Living with Jesus isn't enough. We have to live in Jesus and Jesus in us. A heart open to God can receive the Spirit. Life completely changes. In my ministry, I'd known many people who came faithfully Sunday by Sunday to church, but at, that actually was the extent of their commitment. They, they turned up every week until one day they invited the Holy Spirit into their lives. What a transformation! What zeal for the Lord! The fruit of the Spirit come alive. Our relationship with God has another key truth for us in John chapter 16. Verse 15 says, all that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. And this is important for us as followers of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will make known to us all that Jesus knows and experiences and shares within the Trinity. We'll know what it means to share in the blessings of the communion, the perfect communion of love and fellowship and friendship that is in the very heart of God. Jesus, the Son of God, our Saviour, shares in that perfect fellowship of family and love. And we, as adopted sons and daughters of God, through faith in Jesus, are invited into that same perfect fellowship of family love. Spirituality is the word we often hear these days in relation to Christian faith. If we were speaking to a believer in the 15th and 16th century, he or she wouldn't have a clue what we were talking about. Spirituality is a relatively modern word we use when talking about the spiritual life. And this poses a problem because it implies it's part of the life we lead. But our spiritual life is the totality of who we are and what we are. The reality of who we are in Jesus. And by living in the spirit, we have knowledge. We know where we are in our relationship with God. We have stillness. The psalmist writes, be still and know that I am God. God is speaking to us always, every day, in his word, in our lives. Are we listening? Growth 
Living in the Spirit gives us growth. Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We are growing spiritually in our lives in as we dwell in Jesus. And living in the Spirit brings joy. We read in the book of Acts of believers being filled with the Holy Spirit and being full of joy, that lasting quality of life, the joy of the Spirit in and through the Lord Jesus. May that be your experience this day and all your days. Amen. And now the band are going to lead us in our next song, There is a Redeemer. of intercession. Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Loving God, as we gather in this time of worship, send down your Holy Spirit, we pray, that our lives, our minds, our hearts and our souls may be nourished and enlivened by your life-giving presence. We pray for a movement of your Holy Spirit through the worldwide church, that it may remain faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May your church's work and witness in these often uncertain and challenging days continue to testify to the grace, mercy, truth and love of Jesus. We ask your blessing on all the expressions of compassion and tenderness and care performed by many people in different walks of life to both friend and stranger. 
Loving God, we pray for those who are spiritually low because of ill health, broken relationships, loss of a loved one, lack of physical contact, through inability to meet friends and classmates, through fear and uncertainty, loss of employment and difficulties in making ends meet. Compassionate God, as vaccines are rolling out in the treatment on coronavirus, we pray that the less well-off countries would be included as an integral part of the overall programmes. May any moves to selfishness and separation be thwarted and replaced by a real sense of oneness. Gracious God, we pray for your world, increasingly on the brink of calamitous decisions and reckless actions. Peace is a word often used, but a situation seldom sought in earnest. Guide the leaders of nations in their actions and policies. Lord God, we continue to pray to you for the people of Syria, of the Yemen, of the West Bank, of Russia. We pray for the relief agencies bravely working to improve people's lives in so many needy places in your world. Loving God, we pray for family and friends, for those close to us. We bring their needs to you in the silent prayers of our hearts. Provide for their needs, we pray, through the glorious riches of your promise in Christ Jesus. All our prayers we bring in and through the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our closing hymn is In Christ Alone. I'd like to give my thanks to Ken and Katie who've taken part uh, in this service today. And so let's sing along with the band In Christ Alone. Power of Christ in me from life to 
Jesus Christ to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can never plan me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. The power of hell, no scheme of man can ever plan me from his hand till he returns. And so our final blessing, go in peace to serve the Lord with the love of Christ in your heart and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.